so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's uh, Tuesday afternoon and has become quite a um, habit to have an uh, uh, ELISA webinar on the, on the schedule. So welcome you on behalf of uh, Francesco Pignatelli, uh, who is the action, ELISA action leader and uh, program manager at the Joint Research Center. Uh, welcome also on behalf of Lorena Hernandez, uh, the project officer and responsible for the knowledge transfer activities on the ELISA action. And also on my behalf, uh, Simon Brechar, who is a consultant at Joint Research Center as well, uh, supporting ELISA. Uh, activity. So welcome today to the, the webinar uh, with the blockchain and proofing uh, uh, of uh, uh, location and supporting digital government. Uh, as uh, Before we start, maybe uh, share with you a few further details about the uh, ISA, ISA Square program and the Delize action, uh, which under which we are performing this webinar today. Uh, so ISA Square program is a is an European interoperability program, uh, which is actually aiming for a cross border and cross sector interoperable solution for public administrations, businesses and citizens. Under this umbrella, there are 54 different actions um, actually addressing interoperability from different angles. Uh, while uh, ELISA here is the only action uh, focusing on the location dimension. Uh, so maybe, uh, as you can see on the next slide, so uh, speaking of Elise, uh, George, would you mind switch to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so Elise aims uh, uh, to break down uh, the barriers and uh, promote a coherent uh, and consistent approach to the sharing and reuse of location data across sectors and borders, as said before, uh, in the context of digital uh, transformation. And uh, that's done, that, that is done by supporting different policies, initiatives on European and national level, by uh, providing uh, several reusable and uh, interoperable cross-border and cross-sector solutions and framework for public administrations, business and citizens, uh, by discovering uh, how emerging trends and technologies are impacting on location domain and vice versa, of course, and uh, building a geo knowledge base. And while speaking uh, geo knowledge base, we are coming actually to the knowledge transfer, which are uh, which those webinars actually are the part of it. So uh, Elisa webinar series, um, it's the part of the Elisa knowledge transfer activities, uh, which purpose is to engage in agile way with different topics of relevance to the digital transformation and uh, also to share the ELISA results. Of course, today we are, uh, let's say, uh, dealing with uh, some new topic, which, is, which could be shown relevant for the, for the, for the uh, location enabled with the digital transformation. And uh, Lorena, as a responsible for knowledge transfer, will uh, tell us a bit about uh, our speakers and of course about the, the agenda we have on the menu today. Thank you, Simon. I hope you can hear me properly. Um, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, really glad that you decided to join us in this new webinar of the Elise Action. Um, my name is Lorena Hernandez, and uh, I work for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And again, I'm really responsible for the Elise Action knowledge transfer activities uh, that Simon has kindly introduced earlier. For this webinar, we wish to make a deep dive on uh, one of the considered disruptive technologies, the blockchain. And uh, as usual in our release webinars, um, as you might know by now, if in the case that this is not the first time you are accompanying us, we always, we always approach it, sorry, um, but analyzing the topic from the location perspective. Um, to give more clarity actually on how blockchain can enhance location and location-enabled services, we have today from Deloitte, George O'Neill and Lea Treus, uh, both specialized in public sector policy, along with Damian Scanlon, uh, a blockchain specialist from Deloitte, Ireland. If you go to the next slide, please. And we also have the pleasure to, to have with us today, Ryan King and uh, Katia Zavialova, respectively CEO and Chief Commercial Officer from FOAM. Um, I want to thank them in advance really for being with us because it's really early in the morning in the United States from where they are connecting. And before going through the agenda, I think Simon would like to ask you something. 
Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Lorena. So like always, we will uh, try to be a bit interactive with you. So at the beginning, so now you know about the speakers today, it would be good also that uh, we know about uh, yourself a little bit. So please uh, share with us your affiliation. So whether you are coming from public administration, EU, national, regional, local one, academia research, small or media enterprise, large enterprise, are you independent consultant or representing NGO, civil society organization? Are you a citizen? private person or something other. If there's something other, please uh, share with us, maybe uh, to, to uh, because I, we thought that we had quite a imagination the, to, to uh, clustering the your affiliation. So please share with us with chat box what we have forgotten maybe. So maybe take a few other seconds. Uh, okay, let's stop the polling. So it's, uh, yeah, it looks like that most of you are coming from the national public administration, then EU administration and small and medium enterprise. So please, Lorena, continue with that. Okay, so indeed, uh, now you can see in the screen, one moment, uh, the agenda for today. So to start, uh, um, Deloitte colleagues will walk us through the basics of blockchain, letting us know very briefly, for instance, uh, what is blockchain, what makes it un a unique technology, or how does it work, and what are the fields of application. Uh, this introduction will be followed by a brief overview of the European Union policy context and the relevant initiatives um, by highlighting the growing interest uh, uh, that those have in relation with blockchain. And moreover, um, we will be giving some reflections on uh, the interoperability aspects of this technology. One, uh, once uh, the set has been set, Deloitte colleagues uh, will focus on how blockchain can uh, enhance location by adding a new layer of certainty, let's say, but also on how to enhance uh, location-enabled services in general. And uh, to do this, uh, we'll be looking in depth at two specific elements enabled by blockchain. Uh, on the one side, the so-called uh, proof of location, uh, which is an innovative technology that allows attesting someone's presence at a certain geographic location and time, while guaranteeing both location trustworthiness and user privacy preservation. To explain all of this, we have the privilege to have with us the colleagues from FOM, who, uh, which I introduced earlier, and who will be showing us how this protocol works and in what situations and applications it could be used. And uh, finally, we did not want to overlook uh, one of the key applications of blockchain, smart contracts. Um, smart contracts are um, increasingly relevant, both for the public, but also for the private sector. And we will see what they are, and to better understand how they work, uh, Diamond Scanlon from Deloitte's Blockchain Lab will be showcasing an example they are developing in the field of supply chain by stressing the intrinsic role that, that location plays in the various stages of the smart contract proposal. Um, I hope you will enjoy the webinar, and without more delay, since we have so much to share, I hand over again, uh, again sorry, uh, to Simon. Yes, thank you very much, Lorena. So before we are continuing with the speakers, it would be good to know a bit how, how much do you uh, know about the blockchains and certain concept that so there are three questions please that you are pleased to kindly invite you to answer. So what is your le level of knowledge on blockchain? Do you know it very well, uh, rather well, a little, or you don't know it? Uh, have you ever heard of proof of location on the blockchain? So how this concept is familiar to you? And Last but not least, have you ever heard of smart contracts? So please take some time so that uh, our speakers will have a bit of inside what level of, uh, uh, of acknowledgement you have with those concepts. Let's take another five seconds and then we stop with the polling. Okay, let's close here. So we'll share the results here. Uh, so uh, Regarding the knowledge of blockchain, you know a little, rather little than well or very well on the blockchains. The most of you uh, have never heard about the proof of location. Uh, so 60%, 40%, yes. And uh, the most of you have heard of the smart contracts. Interesting. I think it's a good input for our speaker. So please, uh, George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. I will actually uh, take Sorry, over. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So indeed, let's uh, let's start off with uh, with the basics. Uh, so we will start uh, the first section with some key definitions for this uh, webinar. 
uh, and they might be uh, familiar to you already. So first of all, uh, distributed ledger technology is indeed what refers to the protocols and supporting infrastructure that allows computers in different locations to propose and validate transactions and update records in a synchronized way across the network. And now relatedly, blockchain is a type of distributed ledger in which value exchange uh, transactions are sequentially grouped into blocks. So each block is chained to the previous block and immutably recorded across a peer-to-peer -peer network using cryptographic trust and assurance mechanisms. Um, now on to the next a proof of location, uh, which is indeed one of the key topics of today, is a digital certificate that attests someone's presence at a certain geographic location at a certain time. And lastly, um, a definition that might be familiar to, to most of you then is that a smart contract is an agreement between two people in the form of computer code. So uh, they run on the blockchain, so they're stored in a public database and cannot be changed. All right, so with these uh, definitions in mind, um, just quickly a little bit about what is blockchain and why does it matter? Uh, so essentially blockchain can be seen as a combination of three uh, concepts, let's say. So we have um, cryptography, which is uh, associated with the process of, of converting ordinary plain text into unintelligible text and vice versa. So blockchain uses uh, public key cryptography functions, excuse me, for transparency and privacy. Uh, and then secondly, game theory is also applied to maintain an incentive really for networks to validate by consensus and, and also to protect the blockchain from malicious activity. So you have uh, uh, nodes or peer-to-peer or -peer networks that validate transactions by consensus. And this happens through following economic incentive mechanisms. And then lastly, you have the peer-to-peer the -peer networks and they ensure that each client, user, server, will have identical copies of the blockchain, which again fosters transparency. Uh, so in sum, we could say that blockchain is a solution for situations in which you have or need a shared platform where parties can collaborate securely without um, concerns for privacy, transparency, uh, or, or corruption. So what is really the the key process uh, of, of blockchain and this is really a, a simplified explanation um, but say that I want to complete a transaction. I would first initiate this transaction. Once I do this, it's broadcasted to the network. Then nodes or peers can validate this transaction. And once validated, it's added uh, to a new block. This new block is then added to the blockchain and distributed to all the nodes. And at this point, uh, the transaction will be uh, completed. So next slide, please. So now how do these uh, concepts fit together? So essentially they can be, be uh, described as levels of technology. So you have one level that supports or, or provides the foundation for the other. So as you can see from this figure here to the left, uh, you could say that the distributed ledger technology provides um, the protocols and supporting infrastructure for actors to propose and validate transactions across the network. Um, as mentioned, the blockchain is a particular type of distributed ledger technology and the proof of location finally can be placed on a blockchain, blockchain sorry, as, uh, as the validation requirement. So next slide, please. Um, in brief, essentially, uh, for this webinar, we'll look at two possible roles for location data in relation to blockchain. So indeed, uh, the first is about using proof of location on the blockchain. So here, 
we could say that the location data is really the core service that's stored on the blockchain and this provides a secure uh, proof of location whilst uh, on the other hand uh, and the second category here is that you can have applications that use location data blockchain applications that is um, but the location data may or may not be stored on the blockchain so we'll explore some some examples of that through this webinar as well um, and on that note, I think uh, Simon had a poll for us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Yes, indeed. Um, so before entering into the discussion, which in which domain uh, blockchain may be so <clears throat> supportive, it's a question to you. So have you ever used a service or application that has been supported by blockchain? Mm -hmm. So it looks like more no than yes. So let's have another five seconds. Thank you very much for your votes. So let's share the results with you. So about, about 60, 59% actually have never used the service application support, supported by blockchain. Another 41%, yes. So please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, indeed, um, blockchain is being applied to to a wide range of public and private sector use cases, uh, and many of these require uh, location data. So here, uh, experimentation in the blockchain and areas where uh, location related services are relevant play a key role. Um, so we have listed a few examples. This is, of course, a very non-exhaustive list of, of application areas, but it's just to, to give you an idea of potential um, application areas where location also plays a role. So let's say, for example, financial services and, and insurance, especially for the latter, you may need a proof that someone was at a certain place at a certain time. Benefit of blockchain here can be increased transparency, reduction of risk. Um, if we talk about public services, um, we see that uh, services that leverage smart contract automation uh, can be very useful, especially for uh, land titles, issuance, etc. Uh, benefits here is that uh, we have an interoperable and tamper proof infrastructure that can provide citizens with data protection, improved accessibility, and protection from fraud. Uh, for the two um, the two bottom categories, so supply chain and trade finance, sustainable energy. Um, here we can just briefly mention that say that you want a secure and verifiable uh, means to track goods, and this can also be for sustainability purposes. Uh, the benefit of the blockchain is that it can empower buyers with the means to ensure some sort of authenticity and traceability actually of, of goods throughout the, the supply chain, which we will look uh, further into. Um, but in sum, uh, what we see already is that the proof of location blockchain services and other uh, location enabled blockchain applications could really provide significant benefits um, across both the private and public uh, sector. So I think on that note, I will give the floor to uh, one more slide, excuse me, here is essentially just um, an overview of different uh, real world use cases of blockchain. So what we've done here is that we've circled um, a few examples where the location element is especially um, relevant. So we can see that it stretches from anything to, from land registry, border control, shipping and fishing, uh, transport. Um, it's just to show you that the, there are a wide array of, um, of use cases that are currently being um, explored and, and implemented. Um, so yes, indeed on that note, uh, I think we can close the introduction and, and I give the floor to, to George. Thanks, Leah. So um, we'll just talk now a little bit about having had a first introduction to blockchain about uh, what the EU is doing and uh, what the European institutions are doing to ensure that Europe is active and leading in this area of blockchain, including in relation to location data. Um, so the kind of the key uh, point in this is the, is the uh, European blockchain strategy, which has a number of different strands that uh, in terms of what the EU is doing or wants to be doing in, uh, in relation to blockchain. And these include relation to uh, legislative acts, to funding, 
to political support and joint projects and to research and standardization initiatives. In the legislative side, for example, uh, we have uh, recent action on the regulation of marketing in crypto assets, which has, has um, significant relevance for blockchain. Um, and in general, there are efforts to, to identify what the uh, legal uh, pain points may be in relation to this technology. Then on the uh, uh, other side, if we look at, at funding, there's a range of uh, funding available through the different EU projects related to, uh, well, has been related to, to Horizon and going forward also through the Digital Europe program uh, to make sure that uh, there is support for the different uh, blockchain research and so forth that's being set up. And, and this also feeds into support for, uh, well, general political support for joint projects. Uh, this is notable through, through the European Blockchain Partnership, and in particular, a concrete instantiation of that is the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, EBSI, which is uh, a, um, a blockchain infrastructure for, for public services being, being developed and supported by the Commission uh, and, and Member States, which has um, uh, interesting applications that have been tested already in relation to, for example, self-sovereign identity, sharing of digital credentials and things like education. And then also we can look at uh, uh, EU support for standardization initiatives and involvement and support to the blockchain standards community. And there has been some work as well, uh, more close to home within the Leeds Action and ISA, ISA Squared uh, in recent studies on, on blockchain and its role for digital government. So to expand slightly on the, uh, the just that interoperability aspect before to going into some of the location data sides that I, I'm sure you're all keen to hear about. Um, so it's customary to talk about the blockchain in just uh, in, in casual talk, this is often done, but in reality, there are many different blockchains and just to take kind of a well-known public one, public blockchains, for example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and you could list a number of others. Um, so what happens if you want to exchange data and transactions between the different blockchains? Uh, well, if the systems are not interoperable, then, uh, then, then there are going to be issues and not much is the answer. And these blockchains need to be able to communicate with, uh, with each other. And as in so many uh, other domains, a key way to achieve this is a standard-based approach, standard-based solutions. And there are uh, efforts um, within, uh, and it's important to support the blockchain standardization community um, in relation to this. Um, and there are efforts on this then, there are groups working on this already both within the, uh, uh, in the specific area of, uh, of location with the Open Geospatial Consortium with its working group on blockchain and more general standardization uh, efforts on the International Organization for Standardization. But now to, to come a little bit to the, the real key topic of this webinar about how blockchain can enhance location and location enabled services. The first um, uh, aspect that we would like to speak about in relation to this is, uh, is proof of location, which from the initial survey, um, uh, we know uh, that, that perhaps a number of you are not yet familiar with. But as, as, uh, as the participant group in this web webinar certainly do know, there are a whole range of public and private services which, uh, which require and need users to show or, or prove their location so they can access that service or so that the service can operate uh, properly. And as you see on the slides, there's a, a list of examples. We can think of tracking and tracing parcels in the, in the private sector um, to make sure you know where, uh, where they are and where they are in the supply chain. We could think perhaps of emergency services when they need to locate uh, someone uh, who needs, needs support. We could think of just accessing local services, um, which need some proof of perhaps of residence or at least that you are uh, in the particular uh, zone. Um, or in the private sector, again, maybe looking at copyrighted protected works and territoriality uh, and, and ensuring that only people within that, that territory uh, can access them properly, properly access that, those works. But of course, there are existing services that can uh, that can provide a, a kind of a proof of location or can share a particular devices, location data through different well, satellite technology, of course, of triangulating different different points. Uh, GPS is, of course, a prominent example. 
So why use the blockchain? Um, and the, the answer to that comes back to some of the features that we mentioned earlier, uh, which comes down to the, the, the intrinsic nature and architecture of blockchain as a secure and decentralized system. And the reason you might want to put location data um, or have a proof of location service on the blockchain uh, are, are closely linked to this. It's linked to the potential security benefits of that and the privacy benefits of that. So the security benefits, uh, because of the architecture, it means there would be no single point of failure, um, much more difficult to, uh, for it to be compromised and attacked or, and potentially leading to the production of incorrect information. On privacy benefits along this, much the same lines because it, uh, this is sensitive location data in many cases may pertain to a particular individual. And you want, we want to make sure that that's encrypted and secure. And there's a number of different uh, initiatives or companies that are, that are working on this. You see a few of those on the screen already. Um, and we're very lucky actually to have with us today uh, some representatives um, from, from Foam uh, who are going to talk to us for the next few minutes on, uh, on, on their approach to this and how they are providing proof of location on the blockchain. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to, to Katja and Ryan. Thank you very much for the introduction, George. Um, yeah, so introducing uh, Foam and some of our approach to using blockchain and technology. Uh, the Foam protocol is meant to be a new location service that can provide secure, fault tolerant, and ubiquitous location services that would work independent of GNNS or any sort of satellite system. Um, from our approach and what was introduced and what is interesting about blockchain, is that uh, current location data cannot be authenticated in a manner that is compatible or interoperable um, with blockchain standards. Uh, blockchain applications seek specific kinds of fraud prevention and decentralization, as was introduced in the overview, uh, kind of nodes participating in building or running a blockchain uh, may have game theory or economic incentives to kind of produce the blocks of that system. Uh, and that's something that currently doesn't exist with location infrastructure. Um, additionally, uh, there are issues with kind of third party use of location data in terms of privacy and transparency. Uh, we often hear stories about uh, innocuous things like a weather app on your phone is actually selling your data uh, to financial institutions or things to that effect. Um, so we're interested in ways that users can have more control over their location data. Uh, and something that also is very um, prominent in new forms of blockchains is actually data governance. So not only can you own your data, um, but how can you actually uh, participate in having a say in how this protocol will develop or change over time. Um, so when looking at location uh, today, uh, GNS systems are a massive technological breakthrough that enable values across many uh, sectors and definitely will continue to be. And there are many companies and initiatives and governmental uh, situations that are working on improving that or addressing things like um, multi-path uh, jamming or spoofing. Um, and specifically, we're looking to offer a service that can generate these certificates that will be stored on a blockchain uh, and be enable uh, automation as well as these kind of audit trails. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so at FOAM, uh, we're working on a proof of location protocol. And the core offering is this presence claim, which is this digital certificate that will be generated by a user uh, or an autonomous agent or asset like a delivery robot. Um, so what we are building and working on contains both uh, software. So software that has time synchronization algorithms and localization algorithms, as well as cryptographic proofs. Um, and this software is running on a hardware stack, uh, which is kind of domain specific to this problem where we're using software-defined radios as well as FPGAs uh, for localization of these packets. Uh, and this is meant to be kind of uh, using the most new forms of low-cost chips that are extremely powerful. Uh, we also have a blockchain-based stack where uh, this data by these radios will be stored on these blocks being produced by these radios, uh, keeping track of all the location data. As, um, and currently we are using um, low-power-based radios um, but the foam software for the blockchain is actually radio agnostic. So we've actually been exploring and experimenting, um, running this software on 5G uh, and are open to other kind of radios like ultra wideband. Um, so next. 
Um, so this is an example image of actually where our, the first kind of foam location network has been built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Brooklyn, New York. And so the way the foam system works is with at least four terrestrial based low power radios. Uh, we call them zone anchors. Uh, in this image, they're represented by the blue. So they may be on different rooftops or different locations. So this will be a terrestrial based network. Um, and these four radios, and there may be more, uh, we call that a zone of coverage. And these zone anchors uh, will be running a radio protocol uh, using pseudo ranging in kind of a technique similar to GNSSS for uh, doing localization. But they will also be producing blocks on a local blockchain uh, specific to that area. And so they're coming into consensus on that every, every radio participant um, agrees of where they were and that they're in sync in time and that they can essentially maintain a quorum of time and space for this specific location. So the idea is that this system is not here to replace uh, any sort of satellite system, but offer a kind of interoperable, privacy-preserving, uh, location-proof um, specific to an area where that is needed, and that network then may grow over time. And so in this image, uh, we have things like a truck or a ferry or a person, and those people for uh, or users for their look, uh, use case may want to generate these digital certificates on the blockchain, uh, proving where they were. Uh, maybe it's a delivery. Uh, that will only unlock their payment once they prove they were at the delivery point uh, or something as a ferry is producing this certificate every time it's at its port so that there's an auditable um, ledger of its schedule so that it can maybe be analyzed for improvements or maybe an actual user is playing a game like Pokemon Go that is spoofed often uh, in terms of location of players cheating so this may be open new ways for kind of marketing initiatives or gaming where you have this kind of coverage of this new system that is uh, connected to a blockchain and interoperable with all other kind of blockchain applications and offers a new way for a user to kind of generate a privacy preserving history of their location that then can be automated and used inside smart contracts um, as a proof or a certificate that is difficult to obtain today with other location systems that is interoperable with blockchain. So the phone location system is a built in mind specifically for integrating with blockchain use cases. Uh, next. Um, so this system is meant to provide the tools for verified and secure location services. So this would include its own um, low power radio system where a network would be set up in an area where the service is desired. Uh, the car offering is then this presence claim certificate. So if a human user or a vehicle or a drone is interacting with the system, they can generate a presence claim certificate. The idea is that um, through this game theory incentives and economics, um, that that certificate could only be produced if the uh, person or asset requesting it was physically near these foam radios and could actually do a cryptographic handshake over radio um, in a way that couldn't be spoofed. Uh, we initially have kind of dashboards for different localization uh, visualizations. And this kind of terrestrial network could be set up uh, in a private way, uh, or we are also working on ways that it can be incentivized to kind of be open to the public who would run these radios um, and expand uh, where the service is uh, demanded. Uh, next. Um, so this is just kind of a brief uh, preview of on the left is our prototype a radio gateway that has a low power radio and other components like a FPGA for processing a localization as well as kind of access uh, to the internet, whether it be uh, Wi-Fi or LTE. Uh, and on the right end is an example of some of the dashboards we have made for kind of tracking assets uh, and visualizing the blockchain data of this kind of radio blockchain of this local zone. And next. Um, so just to kind of summarize, uh, in this system, this new kind of radio network is running a blockchain and coming to consensus uh, through these kind of incentive mechanisms uh, about what they actually happened, so which users they interacted with, which location proofs were generated, and that all of them were kind of in sync. Uh, this is meant to kind of enhance automation so that location data could be used in a privacy preserving way, but integrate with other kinds of blockchain applications interoperably. And the idea is that if this uh, radio network uh, on the public side is kind of driven by community participation or service providers running these radios, uh, there will be a means for them to have a say in how the protocol changes or develops. Uh, next. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand this over here now to my colleague and co-founder Katya, who's going to speak about, uh, I was speaking about how the protocol will operate. She's going to speak about uh, some ways that the 
protocol can enable new kinds of use cases and applications. So go ahead, Katya. <clears throat> Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I want to touch base uh, uh, one more time uh, on the real-world applications and uh, how they how they can benefit from proof of location. Uh, so we see uh, a wide array of use cases um, for local governments, cities, mobility, insurance, gaming, IoT, and supply chain. Um, so for local governments uh, and and smart cities uh, proof of location, or we call them presence claims, would allow to automate payments um, paid for paid for roads uh, and make them more secure. Um, in mobility, adding an additional location tracking layer uh, and fraud prevention will support the growth uh, of mobility services uh, and autonomous vehicles. Uh, in insurance, um, proof of location will allow to automate uh, conflict resolution through authenticated location proofs uh, on blockchain ledger. Um, in gaming, we see that proof of location would allow games to offer play players location-based rewards. Um, in the internet of things, uh, secure location verification uh, will we'll make IoT devices data uh, more secure, which is uh, so important um, for scaling that technology. Uh, and in supply chains, proof of location will allow to make the product tracking uh, from supplier to customer uh, verifiable and more precise. Okay. Thank you. You had one more slide there, Katya, that you were presenting? Uh, yes, and this is just the last slide on the foam location protocol. Um, the key features uh, and values and benefits uh, that we see is that it's trustless, independent, open, uh, accountable, and incentivized. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much to, to both of you for that uh, uh, for that insight into the into the particular product you're you're providing um, and and all that information on proof of location. In this second uh, in the second section, what we want to look about is which, as Leia kind of first uh, introduced to you, is not just uh, how this proof of location may be provided on the blockchain, but what may be the other role of location data in uh, in blockchain. Uh, services and different blockchain applications, such as the ones that we discussed that could be developed um, through all the different uh, uh, sectors uh, that were mentioned earlier. Um, and one uh, exciting or interesting uh, use and possibility uh, in this area is, is that of uh, using and putting smart contracts on the blockchain and also using uh, location data in, in relation to this. As one of the conditions, so a uh, a smart contract, as you see, there is a agreement between two people, which is in the form of uh, computer code. Um, it, it as it's stored on the blockchain, it has the advantage of being um, transparent to the two parties; they can check if it's been altered or tampered with, and it will automatically execute if the conditions are fulfilled. And so, again, as was often the case in uh, these blockchain applications is very good for a situation where perhaps there isn't much uh, trust and can help to create this trust and efficiency as it's uh, instead of having to rely on someone's word, you can, uh, it is there in the code what will happen if conditions are fulfilled. So just to reiterate then, smart contracts uh, will be between two particular entities uh, who have an agreement between them. It will involve some condition and that condition could be, for example, that you have um, uh, a particular, uh, it could be related to location itself. Uh, for example, that a particular parcel or package that you have ordered has arrived at a particular location. And it will result in, if that condition is fulfilled, then, then there is an, an outcome. So for example, perhaps the outcome is that you will automatically make a particular payment for that parcel. And again, those, uh, those advantages 
are that, uh, well, it's, it's automated. So there's kind of a ease of use and efficiency there, self-executing, and it's transparent and tamper resistant. And to expand a little bit then on those use cases that we might be uh, interested um, uh, in relation to the use of location application, uh, location data and both smart contracts uh, and, and, and blockchain more generally. Um, on the one hand, very similar to that example, I, I sketched out a little bit there related to the, uh, the supply chain and tracking deliverables and automatically updating information on these deliverables so that involved parties are informed, perhaps changes of ownership or controlled or tracked, and generate data that can be used to improve decision making or uh, yeah, making sure that this data is stored and, and analyzed. Or another interesting use case, um, which we, uh, we, we know is being explored, for example, in the UK with the land registry uh, there um, in the digital streets uh, project, uh, looking at having the land registry and record of ownership on the blockchain. And we can imagine, again, smart contracts being used there to automatically record a change of ownership uh, or indeed to cover uh, the payment for, uh, for a particular property. Um, and and so, so now with those kind of high level examples there, uh, I'll just hand over to my colleague Damien, who will give us a little bit more of a, uh, a concrete example of a, a use case that was developed. Uh, by Deloitte Island. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, George. Um, maybe we can go. Yes, great. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, so Deloitte Ireland, uh, in partnership um, with an industry group um, and our clients, has been looking at what we call our uh, track plus trace asset. Uh, and this is a case study as to um, the initial uh, venture we had into, into this space. Um, driven by uh, changing customer demands and a focus on sustainability and knowing where products came from, um, our partners came to us with a desire to create greater visibility in the supply chain. Um, and the problem statement was that Though in Ireland, the regulator for agri-food require, and I am getting some feedback on the line. Am I audible? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, though in Ireland, the, the agri-food regulator maintain meticulous records on the health and treatment of animals um, and obviously uh, in compliance with EU standards, data on the production of that consumable. Um, the data sources were not capable of providing reliable information in a timely manner to validate the raw materials produced by a particular farmer. Um, and the limitation really, I suppose, the impact of that was um, uh, organizations found it challenging to provide customers with accurate information about the source of input um, for the particular product um, that they were buying on the shelf. So though there was validation of the process um, and the quality of the process, providing accuracy about the source of that particular material uh, was challenging. So our proof of concept application that we developed was a blockchain prototype. And we use this um, to track animals, uh, their behaviors, and their foodstuffs. Um, the purpose of this was to provide insight into animal welfare, sustainable practices, and food safety. All things we identified were uh, becoming increasingly important um, to end customers. Um, <clears throat> the future vision that we set out with uh, for our prototype was that um, we would build a minimum viable product that would in future enable a blockchain platform that could be scaled to other stakeholders. Um, think of uh, other foodstuff processors, so competitors um, who would be using all of the one platform. Um, and this would be scaled across the blockchain to establish a new industry standard um, and to enable um, other technology integration, so interoperability with um, IoT devices, um, uh, other devices, 
but also importantly, existing enterprise scale um, solutions uh, and ensuring that uh, we were adaptable to what was established uh, by, already by the partners. Um, when we look at, at location, um, this was a really important aspect for that, trying to provide near to real time view of what was happening on farms and how was foodstuff being produced. Um, and so we look to um, uh, farm management applications uh, where farmers would on a daily basis uh, inputting farm information and this um, this was you know validated uh, based on location data um, the the um, raw material collection agent uh, when they went and they go on a, on a um, a, a very regular basis, multiple times a week to collect the foodstuffs we were looking at, uh, dairy in this case, they would be um, recording information as they do today and we'd be taking the location uh, and, and new information points from them. And then uh, as is standard for the, the industry practice, uh, there is a, a, a farm regulator surveyor uh, who goes out and, and is also capturing data and ultimately what we identified was we would take these data points uh, bringing them into into the blockchain cross-referencing them um, but also ensuring that each one of them uh, is passed through a smart contract to validate the specific um, I suppose claims being made um, and challenging against that uh, against the what is valid criteria um, from, a, from a production system perspective. Um, why blockchain? Um, as this was a, a proof of concept, we could have started in the cloud, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, solve for the, the end state and, and what needs to be achieved here. Um, and also, it, you know, looking to the future and, and, and the capabilities that blockchain bring. So as was mentioned, a centralized, uh, uh, a decentralized ledger, um, which allows for the recording of transactions that can be verified as we were doing uh, through smart contracts and, and can't be altered. Um, they allow different entities to create joint processes in tandem by leveraging shared data sources enabling interoperability, um, allowing for new sources of data to be captured. And, and really what was important for an industry solution where you could have competitors on a blockchain uh, that, that want privacy, uh, allowing parties to transact direct, uh, directly cryptographically. Um, so, um, you know, uh, protecting uh, privileged information around um, um, different, you know, costs or, or inputs. And then um, ultimately providing the ability to eliminate some processes uh, through automation and efficiency uh, was one, those were the, 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 key, the key drivers really behind why blockchain uh, was such a fit for this location-based uh, solution to an industry problem. Back to you, George. Great, thank you very much, uh, Damien. Okay, so that more or less brings us to the close of the of what we had um, from the uh, from the webinar and the, the material we wanted to cover. Um, so just to wrap up very quickly on what has been uh, what has been said. Uh, of through these different use types of use cases we have seen, both proof of location and the possibility to use location data on other uh, blockchain applications and blockchain services within this, does have the potential to bring significant benefits to both public sector as well as the private sector where we've seen some examples. Um, and this is linked uh, in general to the, the just the basic architectural setup of blockchain applications, which can lead to increased trust and security. Um, uh, however, I mean, continued work is required to actually support this actual uptake of blockchain in the public sector. Uh, uh, a lot uh, that we have seen so far anyway um, are perhaps relatively small scale still and still developing, um, uh, at least in the public sector. Um, uh, and, and so going forward, uh, yeah, there's uh, uh, still need to uh, do further work in order to move towards a, a situation in which these blockchain applications are providing value for citizens, businesses, and public authorities. But uh, that's probably 
enough from me. So I, I would kind of open to any questions from anyone in the audience, whether for us or any of either of our case studies. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of you, to all the presenters and guest speakers as well uh, for sharing with us this, uh, let's say, uh, insights uh, about the blockchain and different use cases and how they, how blockchain actually can enhance the location and enable services. In the meantime, I uh, realized that the uh, chat box was quite alive, but um, since uh, not anybody, not everybody could follow this and. Uh, also, that was not heard in the recording. I would uh, invite maybe uh, one by one uh, the people that uh, posted already questions in the chat box. I think the, I think Gian, Gianfranco Cecconi from European Data Portal started <coughs> with a question to the phone. Uh, please, Gianfranco, can you can you post a question? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, thank, uh, first of all, thank you uh, everybody for for contributing today. Uh, my question was. Uh, purely technical, uh, but comes from a general pattern that as a professional I see often, that is, we all appreciate the potential for the blockchain and the ones of us who work in it are literally in love with it. At the same time, sometimes it's like a bit of an exaggeration, like, uh, is it really necessary? My question uh, in the chat was related to the beacons, so the radio stations that certify uh, the presence at a certain location, and I believe I got a very acceptable a very good answer from uh, Ryan, perhaps. Uh, so I would hand over to him to, to explain why the blockchain has an advantage in respect to conventional cryptography or traditional methods. Yes, uh, yeah. indeed. So uh, yeah, that was a great question. And <clears throat> um, while we are using kind of conventional cryptography, uh, the main point of around the blockchain, I believe that often um, maybe gets overlooked is going back to kind of the game theory and economic incentives. So this was not in the presentation um, fully, but the radio beacons are kind of participating in a local blockchain um, and they will have kind of economic incentives to act honestly. Um, so they have to use uh, in the public version something called foam tokens that have an economic value uh, and stake them to participate as a validator on that blockchain. Um, and that's meant to kind of be something that enables them to enter into what we call a service level agreement that they're opting in to uh, run this protocol honestly. And because all of the data they produce is on a blockchain, part of the protocol is kind of checking that data uh, and making sure it makes sense, even up to the laws of physics. And that's something that they could lose a percent of if found to be acting uh, on honestly or even just found to be offline. Um, and so that's where one of the main benefits of the blockchain comes in is that you could maybe grow this network where anyone could participate. Um, but you have mechanisms so that you don't have people attacking the network or acting in honestly because they all have kind of an economic stake um, on the table. Thank you. And in other words, we don't need to expect, say, government to build this network of beacons or private organizations certifying their own location that may have a bias in, in, in doing, but we can expect anybody potentially to uh, seed uh, locations with the beacons related to places where they have access to and contribute collaboratively to create a worldwide network. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are a number of companies working on new kinds of terrestrial systems, but um, they might have more expensive equipment and are the only entities that can set them up. Um, and we're looking to take lessons from Bitcoin, where if you have the right incentives, you could get you know mass participation to grow the network quicker. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy, satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you, uh, John Franco, for the question and to Ryan for the answers here. Uh, let's move to the next one. I think the next one in the chat was what we, it owns, owns from Flanders, Belgium. Please, Owns, would you like to post your question? I think it was as well to foam. Um, yes, indeed. So, my, my question was in, in what way this was different from the Helium network, um, which I was introduced to recently that's doing, as I understood it, some quite similar work, but then more focused on IoT. Um, uh, yep, so I'll try to answer as best I can. Uh, mm -hmm. As I understand it, uh, Helium is using low power radio as well, uh, but running a protocol called LoRaWAN, uh, which was developed by a company, Semtech, uh, for the LoRa uh, radio. And that's a kind of standard for passing uh, IoT data that is low power and uh, a low throughput. And so they have an economic system for people to kind of host these radios uh, similar to foam. Uh, in the foam case, our kind of radio uh, architecture of the hardware has other components. 
and the radios themselves are running a time synchronization and localization protocol that uh, we've developed. And that's something that doesn't, uh, is not part of the LoRaWAN protocol. So the location within that system uses GPS, but then passes it over low power radio, uh, where we're using our low power radios to kind of build a new location system. And uh, I just want to add that like our main proposition is proof of location. So basically the authenticated location proofs that the customers can uh, order from the network. Uh, and I believe Helium doesn't have that. They provide internet for the IoT devices. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the next uh, comment or question. I think the next one in the chat is, is Eva. Eva, Eva Pauknera from, from Czechia. Please, Eva. Eva, are you with us? Okay, maybe Eva has a problem with the with the with the sound, but I can read the question that Eva posted in the chat. Uh, so the question by Eva, the comment by Eva was uh, a question: the Public administration is supposed to keep the historic track of decisions. Uh, therefore, the archiving and some processes in the cadasters. Uh, isn't this uh, an issue for the approach introduced now? Uh, well, I can. Try and have a have a go at this one. Uh, so I, I guess this is linked to maybe the land registry uh, use case that was briefly mentioned. Uh, for me, I mean, in terms of the historic track of decisions, I mean, I would I would say that I mean it's a choice as to where you store these decisions and whether you are doing this in a uh, as historically perhaps in a centralized manner or a centralized uh, uh, database or in the under the blockchain approach. Um, uh, in a decentralized manner where it's stored in multiple different ledgers uh, simultaneously working through these incentives that we've described. Um, but at least as it's posed, I don't, I don't necessarily see immediately the uh, immediate conflict with that anyway. Okay, thank you, George, for explaining this. Uh, Eva, are you happy with the answer? So just uh, say yes or no. Okay, we suppose you are. Uh, any other question, maybe, that like to be post, posted? There are no, no questions in the chat box anymore. So since uh, it's already one hour gone, uh, I think we'll uh, then conclude with the, with the, with the questions. Uh, and uh, before we end, let's uh, let allow us to share a bit uh, further information with you. So George, would you mind to uh, switch to the next slide, please? Yes, uh, so uh, right before the end, we would like to share with you a bit of information uh, about the, uh, let's say, next webinars. So what we are planning in the next, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, near future. Uh, so in March, you can expect uh, one webinar about the European Union Location Framework Blueprint. This is one of the, let's say, uh, code deliverables uh, on the ELISA framework deliverable. Uh, later on, by the end of March, beginning of April, we are planning an Elise webinar week as a series of three webinars in which we would like to, let's say, share, share with you a bit uh, about uh, what Elise has contributed in the past uh, regarding supporting police policies and initiatives, providing interoperable cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administrations, businesses and citizens, and about uh, the uh, different uh, emerging trends and uh, uh, technologies. Last but not least, uh, in the March and April period, we are planning another, let's say, more technical focused uh, webinar on the location based augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you once again, uh, all the presenters, all the uh, guest speakers, and of course, all the participants uh, to, for being uh, with us today, and also the, the question and the discussion. And uh, as uh, you can see on our last slide, uh, there are some information uh, so where you can uh, stay tuned with us. So uh, once again, uh, you are welcome to join the ELISA community on Join Up to being informed about the ELISA activities and the webinars. You can find us also on Twitter, by email, or uh, on the ELISA playlist where also this uh, webinar will be published. So thank you once again and see you at the next webinar.